So we are starting a new sermon series today, and the new sermon series is called Journey to Bethlehem. Um, it's going to be a little bit different. You're going to be hearing from different preachers. Usually when I start a sermon series, I preach all the way to the end of it, but this is going to be a sermon series that's going to be shared by Pastor Todd and Pastor Jen and myself. We're going to look at certain things that are related to what it means for us to receive Jesus. And the first one today is going to be longing. For us to receive a Savior, we have to long for that Savior. We have to recognize the deep sense of longing, the deep place of longing that we really, all of us are at at one time or another in our lives. And we're going to move from longing to faith, and from faith to hope, and from hope to love. And as we do that over the course of the coming weeks, we're also going to look at some key biblical figures. Today it's Israel. We're going to talk about Israel's longing, what it meant for Israel to be anticipating and hoping for a Savior, to be longing for redemption, for salvation. And then we're going to move on, and we're going to look at Mary, and we're going to look at Joseph, and finally we're going to wrap up around Christmas by looking at Jesus himself. And I, I am really excited about this, about the idea of it being a journey that we're going on through the Scriptures and through these ideas of, of getting ready, these themes of, of what it means for us to be prepared for the coming of Jesus. And I hope that you'll be excited about that too. So the scripture passage this morning that we're going to begin with is going to be Luke 1, 5 through 17. Uh, and if you have your, your Bible with you and you'd like to turn to that with me, we're going to be reading from Luke 1, verses 5 to 17. And I want you to hear God's word now. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well along in years. So once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and you will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord and the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This is God's word. Amen. Let's go to God. Let's prepare this morning by going to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us a sense of longing today. A sense of longing to be brought back from the wastelands that we so often traverse in this life. To be brought back from exile. To be brought back from alienation. To be brought back so that we might be brought home and so that our home might be with Jesus. I pray that in his name you would send your Holy Spirit now to open up our ears, to make ready our hearts to receive the word that you have for us today. And all these things we pray in his name. Amen. There's a town in southern Mississippi called Bunker Hill. You've probably never heard of it. You've probably certainly never been there. In fact, it's not much of a town at all. It's more like just a bump in the road. Probably doesn't even deserve to be called a town. Bunker Hill doesn't have a whole lot of claims to fame, but it is the home of this man, country singer Jeff Bates. In fact, that may be Bunker Hill's only claim to fame. Jeff Bates grew up in Bunker Hill in the 1980s, and he had a difficult time. He was physically abused in some pretty traumatic ways as an infant. And then he was literally left on a stranger's doorstep and abandoned by his parents. 
It's a difficult way to start out in life. Now, he did have a wonderful adoptive family that brought him in and actually cared for him a great deal, treated him wonderfully, but he was not treated by the other children in the town who knew who he was and who knew something of his backstory. He tells a story about one time when he was seven years old, he was backed up on the bus. He was blocked in by an older, a larger child on the bus and who said to him, the Bates family, you're no Bates. You don't belong to them. In fact, you don't belong to anybody. It was the kind of traumatic encounter that stayed with Jeff Bates. And as he began to try to work his way into the country music business as a young man, he felt always a crisis of self-confidence. He always felt as if there was something that he was trying to live up to that he couldn't quite make. And so he was always reaching out to other things to give him that sense of fulfillment and to give him that sense of self-confidence. Now, as he was doing this, as he was trying to work his way into the country music business, traveling a lot, writing songs, he began to drive himself harder and harder until he would get more and more fatigued. And then one night, he was with a friend who he had been working with, and his friend offered him a hit of crystal methamphetamine and told him it will give him a boost of energy and focus that will allow him to keep going on. And he took that hit. And what he found was it did give him a boost of energy and focus. He could stay awake for days. And even more than that, it allowed him to have the self-confidence that he had never had before. All of a sudden, he had that thing that he always felt he had lacked. But of course, it was crystal meth that was giving it to him. And so because of that, it started to give him a lot of other things that were not good for him at all. And the one that it gave him that took over his life was a raging addiction for the drug itself. And as Jeff Bates tells this story, he says that pretty soon it wasn't that crystal meth was helping him to do all the other things that he was wanting to do. It was that everything else that he was doing was all going to trying to help him score the next hit of the substance itself. And pretty soon he had quit his job, and then he had sold all of his possessions, and then he began stealing from his friends just to get enough money to score the next hit. And eventually he was arrested and spent a period of several months in jail. In a way, you might say that Jeff Bates' early life sounds like, well, sounds kind of like a country song. But it was all too real. He was a man who started out with a lot of talent. He started out with a lot of promise in his life, and he wanted to do the right thing, but he found himself doing the wrong thing once and then a second time and then again and again until he couldn't do anything else. He became lost. And eventually Jeff was alienated from even the people who were closest to him. He was like a man in exile from all that he knew to be good in life. When the season curves around to Advent, we begin to focus on the coming of Jesus into the world and specifically to focus on the reason for that. Now, the simplest way that we can break that down is to say that Jesus came into the world to save sinners like us. And that statement is absolutely true. In fact, you might say that that's the most important statement that we can ever know. But while it's true that Jesus came into the world to save sinners like us, it's also true that Jesus wasn't just a, a blank canvas that God decided to spring on humanity apropos of nothing. In fact, there was a context for Jesus about when he came into the world, and part of that context was the history of the people that he came out of and what God had been doing with that people all along. The story of Israel, excuse me, the story of Jesus, in fact, begins with the story of Israel. And it especially begins with the story of Israel's longing for a Savior. For you see, when God decided that he was going to have a family, when he decided he was going to have a people of his very own, he created that people and made him, them for himself. We hear this 
from the word of God given to the prophet Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 7 where God says, For you are a holy people, a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, to be his treasured possession. And this is a word that God spoke to his people when they were in the middle of the wilderness. This is a word that God had spoken to his people right after they got out of the house of slavery. They had just been liberated. They were a ragtag bunch of nomads who were wandering around in the desert. And God brought them to his holy mountain. And he sent Moses up to receive the word and brought it down to the people. You have to imagine what they must have felt like when they heard these words. That out of all the great empires and all of the great kingdoms that were spread across the face of the earth, God looked down on this little band of people and said, No, you, you are the ones that I want for myself. You are my treasured possession. And the story of Israel then is a story that begins with such promise, begins with such hope. God gives Israel a covenant so that she can live faithfully with him and so that she can live faithfully with herself. He gave Israel a king to rule over her with justice and with steadfast love. God promises to bless Israel and to multiply her people if only she will maintain that covenant, if only she will walk the way of faithfulness. But of course, somewhere along the way, Israel began to stray from home. She began to experience the fatigue of life, of trying to do the right thing, wanting so badly to do the right thing, but of doing the wrong thing once, and then that leading to doing the wrong thing again and again and again until it seemed as if wrong was all she could do. She began to worship other idols. Her own kings began to lead her astray. She forgot the word of her God And so she became alienated from him. She found herself in a kind of exile from all that she knew to be good. And indeed, God tells us through his prophet Amos that that's exactly what he was going to do to her because he had a reason for doing so. He says, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You see the way in which that passage from Amos almost echoes the passage from Deuteronomy, except in reverse, God is reminding Israel that she is his people, that she was the family that he identified. And yet he says, you only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. And therefore, because I chose you, because I showed you how to live, because I gave you that covenant, and because you chose not to keep it, therefore, I will punish you for all of your sins. That's where God's people were when our heavenly father was getting ready to send his son into the world. That is the context that we have to pay attention to. Is God punishing Israel? Yes, he is, but not without reason. Is God sending Israel into exile? Yes, he does do that. He does allow Israel to wander in exile and in captivity, but he's doing that because he loves her. He's doing that because he wants to teach her what it means not to wander lost in a wasteland and in a wilderness, but rather to live with him at home. And so because of that, you heard the passage that Pastor Todd read to us just a few moments ago from the prophet Jeremiah, where God reminds Israel that though she might be faithless, he will always be faithful. And though she may forsake her covenant with him, his covenant with her will always remain steadfast. And as God says through the prophet, I will bring back Judah and Israel from captivity and will rebuild them as they were before. I will cleanse them from all the sin they had committed against me and will forgive their sins of rebellion against me. You hear That language of the prophet, that language of God is all about the language of restoration. It's all about the language of return. I will bring them back. I will restore them. They I will heal and they I will forgive. And so it was that in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. He and his wife Elizabeth 
They were of the people of Israel. In fact, they were descendants of Aaron the priest, which meant that they were descendants of the original priestly family of Israel. And the scripture tells us from Luke this morning that both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all of the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were also childless. In that time and culture, being childless was kind of like being in exile. It was kind of like being punished. And so Zechariah and Elizabeth, these faithful Jewish believers, they were the perfect people for God to send his angel to, to remind them and to remind Israel through them of the promises that he made and was determined to make good on that the time of Israel's exile was about to be over. They were to become the parents of a prophet named John, the one we know as John the Baptist. And he would be the greatest prophet that Israel had ever known. He would prepare the way of the Lord and get the people ready for the coming of their Savior. When you are lost and hurting, when you find yourself in your own life of having the experience of separation from all that you hold dear, the experience of exile from all that you know to be good. Do you know what you need? Do you know what you, you most need? You need a reminder that you are valued. You need someone to remind you of how loved you are. You need a reminder that the feelings of worthlessness deep down inside of you are not true. You need someone to speak the truth to you, which is that you are a beloved child of God and that God loves you with everything that he has. You need to be brought home. When Jeff Bates was alone in his prison cell, serving time for drug possession and theft, he hit rock bottom. He later said that once he was sober, the thought dawned on him that everyone that he had loved, everyone that he had cared about in his life, he had driven away and he had used and he had abused and he had pushed away from him. He later said that when all of that thought came crashing down on his mind and on his heart, it was too much for him to bear and he just cried out to God. And in that moment of crying out to God, there was a memory, a memory from seven-year-old Jeff that came back to him. It was a memory of the day that that older boy, that bigger boy, had confronted him on that school bus and had told him, you're no Bates, you're not anybody. And he went home and he asked his mom, he said, is it true what that boy said? Is it true that I'm adopted, that I'm not really a Bates? And she said to him, he remembered later, didn't just say to him, she took him up in her arms. And she looked into his eyes and said, yes, you're adopted. <laughs> but oh yes, you most certainly are a Bates. Jeff, you need to know that you are nothing less than an answer to prayer. And she said, I love you with everything that I am. And besides, you're more special than that boy on the bus. You're more special than every other child at the school or on the playground. And you're more special because I chose you. I got to pick you for myself. And he said that when that memory came back flooding into his mind and flooding into his heart, all of a sudden something remarkable happened. Because in that moment as he had cried out to God and he was reminded of his mother's love, all of a sudden the love of God became real for him as well. And he knew in that moment that he was just as beloved of God himself that he was God's chosen son. And indeed, as the scripture tells us in Romans 8, that he was made a member of God's family by adoption. By adoption through the power of the Spirit to live forever in God's family. 
According to Jeff Bates, it was only when he turned his life over to God that things began to make sense for him. It was only when he got down on his knees and he poured out his heart before God and he cried out and he was given that experience of God's love that all of his vision began to come into focus. And of course, of course the same is true for Israel too. It's only when Israel turned away from her idols and turn back to God. Indeed, it's only when Israel was sent a savior to lead her home that her own life began to make sense too. And just as it's true for Israel, so too is it true for us. For Israel's story, in the end, is our own story too. We know what it means to wander. Lost in a wilderness land. None of us wants to be there. We want to be in a place of belonging. We want to be in a place of love. We want to be in a place where we know we are home. The journey to Bethlehem begins with the experience of longing. Friends, we can't be saved until we know we need to be. We can't be brought home until we admit that we've been in exile. Mary and Joseph are already on the path to where Jesus will be born, the path to Bethlehem. Let's go with them. Amen.